Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our next installment of the For the People series uh, that we're doing here for Tarrant County College. Uh, today we have Christopher Menken of our Southeast campus, and he's going to be looking at uh, the environment, uh, government policies that have been enacted uh, throughout the years uh, to help with the environment. Just a little bit about uh, Dr. Menken. He uh, graduated from uh, Texas A&M with his bachelor's degree in history. Uh, he then went on to the University of North Texas, where he received both his master's degree and his PhD. Uh, go Mean Green. Uh, so now, uh, Dr. Minkin, I'll turn it over to you and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. So I'll go ahead and jump right in. So today we're talking about the hidden spirit of the wilderness. So it's a quote we'll talk about a little bit later from Theodore Roosevelt, who's going to be one of the great proponents of environmentalism and conservation in the United States. So we'll be covering a lot of stuff. We're going to do a little bit of definition work just to make sure we understand the words and what we're talking about. Then we'll go back to early America, kind of the first settlers, kind of how they saw it, and we'll work our way up until the modern day. So when we look at definitions, so first off, environmentalism. So this is basically, when we talk about environmentalism, it's a catch-all phrase for anything that's done to try to help preserve or conserve any of our natural resources or wildlife or kind of the status quo on the earth. So we're trying to promote a healthier, sustainable earth in some form or fashion. This takes all different kinds of forms because it's kind of this catch-all phrase. Now, the other two kind of similar but slightly different phrases are going to be conservation and preservation. So the first one, conservation, is where the U.S. tends to focus more than preservation, although in more recent years we will see a bigger F emphasis on preservation. So when we talk about conservation, it's not just about protecting wild places and nature, it's about kind of a dual effort to protect it, but also to utilize the resources on or in these areas respectfully and that will preserve them for future generations. So there is a preservation component, but we're using the resources. So be it the timber or the water or the animals, there's some sort of resource that humans are using in some capacity. So that's conservation. We're trying to conserve it for future generations. Preservation is slightly different. Basically, we're going to designate a piece of land, either a wildlife preserve or a nature preserve that is basically not to be touched. We can go through and experience it, but we're not going to be doing any logging in that area. We're not going to be harvesting any animals from that region. It's basically designated to be a protected wild area. So for most of America's history, we're either just using the resources up or by the time we get to kind of the turn of the 19th century, we're starting to see a lot more conservation efforts. So let's jump to the beginning of U.S. history and talk about the earliest kind of conceptions of how Americans would have perceived nature and perceived the resources that were around them. So one of the first ideas that English colonists would have brought with them from Europe to the United States or to the 13 colonies first and then what became the United States is going to be the idea of the European commons. So whenever we think of this concept of commons, today we would understand it as common land that anybody can use. And that's kind of what it was back then, but with a slightly different angle. So this is part of the old manor system. So you would have a noble of some sort, say in England, who owned a big tract of land. And you had areas in which people could, so the people living on the land, so you know, at one point it would have been serfs, another point it would have been peasants, and then eventually it would have been free citizens that would have lived on the land. But they could use some of these lands for common use, be it grazing or farming or whatever type of agriculture was allowed in that area and kind of governed by whatever noble lived in that area. Now, this is the kind of idea that's going to be brought to the United States and implemented at first, but it's very quickly going to die out. We're not going to see this in very common use in America for one main purpose or for one main reason. And that's because where England and much of Europe had very finite land resources. It had been settled by large civilizations for a long time. 
That meant most of the land was owned. In order to inherit it, you had to have a father or a relative that had a large tract of land that you could then inherit. With the immigration to the United States, or what becomes the United States, you now have a seemingly endless amount of land. Now, it was occupied by Native Americans, so it wasn't free land that was not occupied by anybody, but as far as Europeans were concerned, it was effectively unlimited amount of land. And we see this new land in America as this endless and boundless resource. And we're going to use it like that for the early period of American history. And as we spread westward across, across the continent, we'll begin using up resources rapidly. And we see kind of nature as this endless and bountiful pool which we can draw from forever. But very quickly, within about 100, 200 years of the United States being founded, we start seeing that some of these resources are in fact not endless. And this is where we start seeing other movements begin to rise. So kind of at the beginning to mid of the 19th century, so the mid 1800s, we see a new movement called transcendentalism come to the forefront. So this is a new philosophical movement. It has religious components, but it shares more with philosophy rather than a true religion. Now it has some basis in Christianity, but it borrows heavily from other religious traditions as well. Now, some of the key beliefs of the transcendentalists include transcendental knowledge, which is this idea that you favor the questioning of religion, so you don't believe religion outright, you question it, in preference to a more personal relationship with God. So it's not necessarily a Christian God, but some sort of what they call the oversoul, this kind of overarching monotheistic deity, but not necessarily a Christian God or any particular religion, God, just kind of this overall natural God. And we often attain some of this knowledge and this kind of relationship with God through time and nature. Now, the transcendentalists kind of share one of the most important or most prominent American traditions, which is that of individualism. This goes back to this belief that there is a kind of individual connection with God and with your kind of philosophical and religious beliefs, and you attain that through kind of personal evaluation and self-reflection that can lead to a harmonious life. Now, despite being heavily individualistic, they do believe in that oversoul I mentioned, this kind of overarching connection between all people and nature. Now, the transcendentalists do borrow some of their ideas from Indian religions, and this is Indian in the subcontinent sense, not in Native American sense. So you will see some influence from Indian texts when you get more into the weeds of transcendentalism. And there's a certain idealism that's inherent in the transcendentalist movement. And this leads to an effort during this period, and you see this partially uh, connected to the Second Great Awakening, but it has its own kind of angle as well. But the creation of utopian societies and communes where people are trying to live together in a perfect society. Most of them don't work out because despite this idealistic view of the world and humanity, the problem is we are humans at the end of the day and it doesn't always work out great for us when we try to live a perfect society. Now, what ties the transcendentalists to what we're talking about today is the importance of nature. The transcendentalists really focused on kind of replacing a church-based worship with time in nature. So instead of going to church on Sundays or like a Wednesday mass, you would take a hike or you would go for a walk through a forest or go kind of reflect near a beautiful scenic view in the mountains or by a lake. So it's this connection with nature and not only for its own inherent beauty, but also because observing and reflecting upon nature, one could begin to understand the inner workings of the natural world. And that would then allow you to understand more about yourself and more about God or the oversoul or how the universe kind of works. So this importance of nature and this push for a better connection with nature kind of lays the foundation for the next generation to begin a true push towards conservation. Now we talk about transcendentalists. Here are some of the big names that we see in transcendentalism. Ralph Waldo Emerson, 
Henry David Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, Amos Bronson Alcott. Now, Thoreau is probably one of the best known transcendentalists, particularly for his book, Walden. And he's going to really push a lot of these ideas about getting in tune with nature, the value of nature. And we see him as kind of one of the main figures of this movement. Now, the transcendentalists were not strictly conservationists or environmentalists, as we have defined at the beginning of the lecture. They do emphasize nature as critical to the future success of American society and this is going to lay the foundation for conservationists to kind of build off of because there is this at first a small group but a growing group of people who reflect and respect nature in some capacity first time we see a true kind of writing down of the ideas of conservation is by a man named george perkins marsh in 1864. In his book, Man and Nature, he kind of lays out the first idea that Earth's resources are not ex inexhaustible. So we're seeing kind of 1864, that's right around the Civil War, so we're getting to the Civil War era. We're seeing resources starting to be depleted in certain parts in the American South. You're seeing cotton start depleting the topsoil, people having to move further west to maintain it. So Americans are starting to see Things are not endless. We're starting to see kind of an industrial revolution, at least in some of the northern states around this time as well. And that is also driving the consumption of resources for coal, for steam engines, and all this kinds of stuff that's starting around this time. And Marsh is going to argue that it's civilization's duty to manage and care for these natural resources so they may be continued to be used in perpetuity, so forever because we want to have these resources not just for our use but for our children and our children's children and for all future generations we want the world to be kind of maintained in a method and a manner that humans can survive on it without overtaxing the world and forcing kind of an environmental collapse now this book will define the next generation of conservation efforts unfortunately though we'll see far more destruction of American kind of ecosystems and American resources before we start seeing a major pullback and effort at conservation uh, that is widely adopted across the United States. Now we do see one other effort in this Civil War era that really shows kind of the future of what we're going to do. And this is when Abraham Lincoln signs into existence the Yosemite Grant which establishes the Yosemite Valley as a protected preserve. And it sets it aside. Now, we're not quite to the creation of the national park system, but that is what this will eventually become. So many people across America, many prominent people in government had traveled to the Yosemite Valley, saw the beauty of the Yosemite Valley, and thought it needed to be preserved for others to see it in the future. And Lincoln agreed with this concept and will sign it into existence. Now we'll talk about a few of the other major national parks as we get to them as they're founded. We won't talk about all of them because we have far too many to talk about today, but I'll highlight some of the big ones and one of the major ones in Texas and things like that. Now one of the big shifts that's gonna happen is just after the Civil War. After the Civil War, the United States is able to partially focus on reconstruction that lasts for about 10 or 15 years after the Civil War, so up into the 18, late 1860s, all through the 1870s, and a little bit sometimes into the 1880s. But at the same time that Reconstruction is happening across the American South, we're seeing the building of the Plains Indian Wars all through the 1860s, 70s, and into the 80s. Now, this conflict with the Plains Indians is going to have a dramatic impact on the the ecology of the United States, particularly on wild animals. Now, one of the big pushes into the West with westward migration is going to be the railroads. So the first transcontinental railroad is going to be completed in the late 1860s. And one of the ways that the railway companies fed their workers was to hunt bison that were on the Great Plains. Now, typically the hunters in the early years of building these railroads only hunted enough bison to feed 
the workers for a few days because they couldn't store the meat easily, so they only hunted a few bison at a time. One industrious bison hunter decided he was, each time he hunted a bison, he was going to skin the bison as well, so take the hide from the bison. And over that season, he manages to amass 57 buffalo hides in 1871. And during the off season, during winter, he returns back to Philadelphia and sells these bison hides for $200 to a Philadelphia tanner. When that tanner realized that these bison hides made extremely high quality leather, he put in an order with that hunter for 2,000 more hides. And this is when we see a change in bison hunting on the Great Plains. Because for a while, it was just Native American hunting, which was already drawing down the bison numbers slightly. But then you have market hunting. And this is the big change in American ecology. So market hunting is when you hunt an animal for the free market. There's some sort of market demand either for the meat or the hide or some resource on the animal where you hunt it for the animal's resources to be sold. And this is going to be disastrous. And we see this all around the world even today where hunting animals for resources greatly depletes the numbers of that animal. Now, this massive new demand is going to push not only a handful of hunters out onto the Great Plains, but thousands of hunters out onto the Great Plains over the next decade or so. So this massive hunting for buffalo hides and this new incentive is going to drive people out. By the mid-1870s, there were perhaps about 3,000 buffalo hunters roaming the Texas Panhandle in search of the rapidly dwindling buffalo herds. Within only 10 years, these hunters would manage to slaughter 3.5 million bison. Hunters would take high-powered 50 caliber rifles and pick off as many bison as possible, while teams of skinners and tanners would process the hides. The meat itself was simply left to rot. There was no way to store, eat, or do anything with that much meat. They would harvest what little meat they needed for that day's meals, and they would leave the rest to rot. When you're killing 15 bison an hour, there's little you do with the animals other than skin them. One buffalo hunter, a guy named Billy Dixon, recalls, no mercy was shown the buffalo. I killed as many as my three men, talking about skinners, could handle, working them as hard as they were willing to work. This was deadly business without sentiment. It was dollars against tenderheartedness and dollars won. Another hunter named Orlando Brown killed 5,700 bison in the first two months of 1876 alone. He fired his 50 caliber rifle so many times that he went deaf in one ear. By 1883, hunters went out to slaughter that year's bison herds and found virtually none left on the Great Plains. So these are all bison skulls gathered over the decade or so in between. Now, this is going to have dramatic impacts on the American ecology, but it's also going to have dramatic impacts on the Plains Indians, these Native Americans that roam the Great Plains, all living off the bison. As the bison herds dwindle, more and more conflict with the U.S. government, the U.S. Army is going to occur. And the end result is many of these Native American tribes and nations are going to be pushed onto reservations as a result of the depletion of the buffalo herds. Now, Theodore Roosevelt, when seeing some of the last bison on the Great Plains, recalls this, quote, So for several minutes, I watched the great beasts as they grazed, mixed with eager excitement of the hunter, was a certain half-melancholy feeling as I gazed on these bison, themselves part of the last remnant of a doomed and nearly vanished race. Few indeed are the men who now or have evermore shall have the chance of seeing the mightiest of American beasts in all his wild vigor, surrounded by the tremendous desolation of his far-off mountain home. So you see, even kind of in the late 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, when Roosevelt himself is going out to the Great Plains, going into the Dakotas, he's seeing the last of these herds that were being depleted in the generation or the decades before he went out west. And this is going to be this kind of idea that he understands this is the end of the species or potential end. And it's only going to be with his own efforts and the efforts of other conservationists that we see the bison survive at all.
Now, it's not just the bison that are being targeted in these hunting or with this hunting. We see the elk hunted to the edge of extinction. We see the grizzly bear virtually wiped out. In places like California, it is wiped out. And this is wild. California has the grizzly bear on its flag. And there hasn't been a grizzly bear in California in over 100 years. Deer, both blacktail, whitetail, and all other versions are hunted to the edge of extinction, just like the elk for their meat in this case. There was a big market demand for elk and deer meat in the eastern cities. Wolves were hunted to the edge of extinction because they were kind of main predators. They often got involved with uh, cattle herds and sheep herds that are problematic. So wolves will be hunted virtually to extinction in most of these western states. You also see various fish and waterfowl hunted to the edge of extinction as well. So this is not just a bison problem, a large animal problem. It is decimating vast portions of American ecology. We see kind of during the same time another park get established, the Yellowstone National Park in 1872. So even as we're hunting some animals to the edge of extinction, some people are fighting for the preservation of some of these wild places. In the case of Yellowstone, it's going to be a man named John Muir. Now we'll come back to Muir in a little bit and talk more about what he does, but he's going to be integral with Yellowstone National Park's creation. Now at first it's going to be a state park in California, but eventually he will become a friend of Theodore Roosevelt. Then Roosevelt will become president and come out and visit Yellowstone National Park and turn it into or Yellowstone State Park and turn it into a national park protected by government regulation. Now another growth during this time is going to be of the sportsman magazines. Now, if you've noticed, I've talked about hunters a couple times now, at first in a negative sense, but then we talked about Roosevelt, who was a prolific hunter, but he also understands that if you overhunt, this could be a problem. So we see in the 1970s and into the 1980s and 90s, the rise of sportsman magazines. So one of the first is the American Sportsman. Shortly thereafter, we get Forest and Stream. And then one of the most prevalent that still survives until today is field and stream. Now these are hunting and fishing magazines that talk about all kinds of strategies to hunt and fish, where to go hunt and fish, but also you see a strong theme throughout these magazines of if we love this so much, if we love fishing, if we love hunting, we want to teach our children, our grandchildren this tradition, we have to find a way to make sure it survives for the future generations. We have to know what's going on. We have to know how to protect it, not just go hunt and kill willy-nilly. We have to find a way to preserve this for future generations. So we have uh, Man in Nature kind of laying the foundation. Then you have these sportsman magazines beginning and continuing that tradition of arguing we need to protect some of these places if we want to enjoy these same experiences in the future. Now, Theodore Roosevelt is going to be one of the single biggest proponents of wild places and wildlife conservation and preservation in American history. He's probably one of the most important because as president, he is going to enact many laws. He's going to lead this progressive era that's coming up in preserving a lot of the land we have protected in America today. Now, at this time in the 1880s, in 1887 in particular, he's going to found something called the Boone and Crockett Club. So this is named after the big pioneers and frontiersmen, uh, Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone. Now, it celebrates hunting and the frontiersmen lifestyle. So going out west, living this kind of hard scrabble life, this tough, uh, experience out on the frontier, hunting to survive, living off the land, this kind of tradition of many of our Western explorers and settlers, but with the undertone of not over harvesting, not over killing or over hunting the wild game. In particular, the Boone and Crockett Club is going to pioneer an idea called fair chase. Now, this is one of the defining aspects of American hunting today. Now, this is their official publication of the 
Boone and Crockett Club today called Fair Chase, but the concept of Fair Chase goes all the way back to the late 1800s. And this is the idea that when you go hunt, the tools you use to hunt and the way you hunt, the animal should at least have a chance of escaping the hunt, of surviving you going out and hunting them. It's not necessarily taking a large caliber, high powered rifle with a powerful scope, finding the animal and secreting yourself away and waiting for them in the prime condition, laying a trap and then killing them with ease. That's not fair chase. There has to be typically today in fair chase, there's a certain tracking component or a waiting component. You have to kind of plan ahead. You have to track the animals. You have to study the animals. There's an expectation that you put in a significant amount of effort up front before you ever harvest a single animal. We see this particularly in the bow hunting community today. That's probably one of the most extreme of the, or the most kind of ardent of the fair chase communities today. You see this in rifle hunting and various groups as well, but bow hunting is probably the most defined of fair chase today. But this is going to be an important foundation because as we want to protect this chance for the animals to escape, the Boone and Crockett Club and other conservationists are also going to be pushing for the regulation of herds, so of deer and elk and all these things, not overhunting, not hunting these herds to the brink of collapse, but instead putting quotas and managing the natural herds so that each year only a certain number of these animals are harvested. So you never bring the herds to such a small number that they reach that tipping point of collapse. Now I have two quotes about or from Roosevelt that I think are important because the first one I'll read out in just a second kind of shares a lot of similarities with some of the concerns we still have today. And he's talking about this at the turn of the century. So from the 1800s going into the 1900s. Now that is a joke picture. Roosevelt never rode a moose, although he did hunt his fair share of moose. Now he says, quote, the United States at this moment occupies a lamentable position as being perhaps the chief offender among civilized nations in permitting the destruction and pollution of nature. Our whole modern civilization is at fault in the matter, but we in America are probably most at fault. We treasure pictures and sculpture. We regard Attic temples and Roman triumphal arches and Gothic cathedrals as pieces of priceless value. But we are as a whole still in that low state of civilization where we do not understand that it is also vandalism wantonly to destroy or permit the destruction of what is beautiful in nature, whether it be a cliff, a forest, or a species of mammal or bird. Here in the United States, we turn our rivers and streams into sewers and dumping grounds. We pollute the air, we destroy, we destroy forests and exterminate fishes, birds, and mammals. Not to speak of vulgarizing charming landscapes with hideous advertisements. Now this last sentence or two really defines kind of the problems, many of which we still have today, where we are corrupting our own resources, where we're polluting the air, we're exterminating species, we're disrupting the ecosystem. And the last kind of phrase, that vulgarizing charming landscapes with hideous advertisements, this is something we are still burdened by today. It has not changed significantly. We've made progress, but there are still similar problems to what Roosevelt is addressing that we are facing even today. The next big quote kind of goes back to that title quote that I had at the beginning of the lecture. This kind of encapsulates Roosevelt's vision of these wild places. There is delight in the hardy life of the open. There are no words that can tell the hidden spirit of the wilderness that can reveal its mystery, its melancholy, and its charm. The nation behaves well if it treats the natural resources as assets, which it must turn over to the next generation, increased and not impaired in value. Conservation means development as much as it does the protection. And you can see here, kind of in the 1900s, early 1900s, he has encapsulated this idea of conservation where it has this level of preservation or protection, but also usage of this land. So Roosevelt's very conscious of what he is promoting at this time. Now we see kind of right before we get to kind of Roosevelt's presidency, uh, the Forest Reserve Act come into existence. And this is going to create 
a large tract of land is going to be protected. So we see the first national force starting to be protected. This is kind of what the national force system looks like today. So we have fairly big chunks of the United States, particularly in the Northeast, or sorry, the Northwest. But all across the nation, there are fairly large forests that have been protected and preserved for future generations, for future use. Some of these do involve some logging and some timber resources, but those are usually maintained in a sustainable fashion, at least somewhat sustainable by today's standards. So this particular act, so this first one, this Forest Reserve Act, set aside initially 13 million acres of land. And these become our national forests that we know and experience today. The next big figure I've touched on earlier is John Muir. Now he is probably the single most important kind of environmentalist in American history. So if Roosevelt is going to be the great conservationist, John Muir is the great environmentalist. So it involves conservation, preservation, every kind of natural movement to protect the earth. In America, in the United States, he is pretty much the root of it. So he has his influences, but the modern movements that we understand them as today all kind of branch out from John Muir. He is kind of the singular figure that defines the national memory of this. Now, most importantly, while he helps found many parks, most importantly, he's going to found the Sierra Club. And this is going to be the first and largest environmental organization in the United States. And it's going to be in existence today. I'm part of the Sierra Club in Fort Worth. So there's chapters all around Texas, all around the United States. They provide a lot of resources, a lot of seminars and lectures, a lot of activism. So if you're interested in nature, interested in the environmentalism movement in the United States, the Sierra Club is a great way to get involved, dip your toe into the water, sign up for one of their newsletters, kind of see what's going on. So I highly re recommend the Sierra Club to anyone who's interested in any of this. Now, John Muir earned titles such as John of the Mountains or the father of the National Park. And his writings, his teachings, his lectures, he is going to be the foundation which we build pretty much everything else off of. Now, there's another historian that also is going to play an important role in conceptualizing wild places for America. If John Muir is talking about kind of preserving the wild places, a historian named Frederick Jackson Turner is talking about taming the wild places. So in 1893, at a lecture he gives, a major presentation he's going to give in 1893 at the American Historical Association, he talks about what he become, what becomes known as his frontier thesis, that American history, the American culture, American identity is founded on or has its roots in the conquest of the wild places, of these untamed wilderness. He says from the dawning of the United States, so from our 13 colonies, the 13 states, and the beginning of westward migration, we've always had a portion of American society, it may have been the smaller portion, but a significant portion, settling the West. And this westward settlement defined America. But he says in 1890, we have settled the continental United States, will become the lower 48 states. And he asks the question, what does it mean for the future of the United States if we have settled all of our territory, if we have tamed all the wild places? So while he's asking kind of a philosophical question about America, and America is going to respond in part by moving beyond our borders, claiming other territory. In 1898, we gained the Philippines and Guam and Hawaii, part of the Spanish-American War in some cases, and we start building what becomes known as the American Empire. But when we talk about these wild places, it's really going to be conservation is going to be part of this answer, preserving some of these wild places so that others can go experience them and enjoy them the same way Frederick Jackson Turner might have, John Weir most certainly did, as Roosevelt did. So we have multiple answers, both on the national level and on a philosophical and conservation level as well. Now, artists also will be important in the conservation movement. In particular, two that were 
prominent at the turn of the century, as we go into the 20th century. You have Albert Bierstadt and Frederick Edwin Church. Sorry, Frederick Edwin Church. So these first two photos are by Bierstadt, and the next two will be by Edwin Church. And this kind of gives you an idea. They're capturing some of these iconic views of America and kind of preserving them in a beautiful format and allowing others who may not have the want or the ability or the desire to travel all across the American West, but see some of the natural beauty and begin to appreciate it in a whole new way. As we enter the beginning of the 1900s, the 20th century, this is going to be defined as the progressive era. Now, this era is kind of a two-sided era. We have a lot of progress. We have a lot of changes, new inventions. We begin getting electricity. We have a new industrial revolution. A lot of stuff is changing. Women get the right to vote by 1920. Society is going to see a lot of upheaval over the next two or three decades. Now, at the heart of that upheaval is going to be Theodore Roosevelt. He is going to be one of our most prominent progressive presidents. Now, in his early years, Theodore Roosevelt is going to be defined by his experiences in his West, in the West. In his late 20s, he had gotten married, and when his wife was pregnant with their first child, their daughter Alice, his wife will give birth, and unfortunately, she had a complicating illness that she will die in childbirth. A few hours later, his mother dies as well on the same day because she had been sick for a while. So on the day his first child is born, he loses both his mother and his daughter. So this is a brutal day for Roosevelt. In his little journal, he has a black X and he says, the light has gone out in my life. And the only way he found to cope with, cope with this pain was to travel out west to the Badlands, to Montana and the Dakotas. And he goes in the biggest fashion. He went out to be a cattleman, a rancher. He has custom buckskin suits made. He has Tiffany, the jewelry company, make a sterling silver knife for him and all these kinds of accoutrements. But it's his experience in the West that allows him to kind of recover and rebuild himself and re kind of shape himself and redefine himself and become the man who he becomes that is this great progressive leader that does become president. So he really came out West as a way to build American character. And he says, if I did it, I want others to do it too. I want other people to go out west. I want other people to go to these national parks and to these wild places and experience the hardship of life that really shows people the extent of what a person can do, that really tests them and allows them to grow in ways you don't get in some of these cities. Now, right at the turn of the century, you get one of the single most important acts for American wildlife. This is the Lacey Act. Now, this is done just before Roosevelt comes into office. Now, it's going to prohibit the trade in wildlife, fish, and plants that have been illegally taken, possessed, transported, or sold. So basically, this means no more poaching. But more importantly, it means no more market hunting. So even if there is a demand for duck feathers or goose feathers, if there's a demand for elk meat, if there's a demand for bison hides, all of that has overnight become illegal. And we now have legal protections that will stop poaching and will allow some of these wildlife species to begin rebounding on their own. Sometimes it'll take human interference to help these species rebound, but this is the turning point, the 1900 Lacey Act, that really begins to protect these animals and prevent the free market from attacking these natural species and allowing them to slowly begin to recover. Now, this Lacey Act in 1900 is going to lead to what becomes known as the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation. Now, while this official kind of understanding and the seven or so points we're going to talk about isn't codified as we will understand it until kind of the late 1990s, early 2000s, 
we'll see pieces of this start coming into existence over the next hundred years. So we're going to run through these points real quick to kind of show you what we're building towards, what by the late 1990s, early 2000s, we really have the gold standard of wildlife conservation, both wild places and wildlife species. So first is the idea of wildlife as a public trust. So this is where all animals are held in common. And this is where we come back to that term common, like we talked about with those European commons. But in this case, we're talking about wild animals being held in common or held in public trust. This means that, say I own a piece of land. If I see a deer on that land, I can't just shoot it. I have to wait for hunting season. I have to make sure I get a deer tag so I have permission to hunt that and a deer license a hunting license so I can have permission and they know I'm hunting that particular animal and I have to verify that I killed the animal and all these kinds of things because that animal is belongs not just to me because it might be on my land today but it might be on someone else's tomorrow it's a national resource so wildlife as a public trust means we all share the protection and use of these animals Second, you can't sell native animals and this is that Lacey Act we just talked about so if you ever buy venison or deer meat today, odds are it's not domestic venison. So it's not a white-tailed deer that you might see in Texas all the time. It's probably a deer from New Zealand where it's an invasive species. So probably very rarely you see kind of wild animals being sold. Most of the bison you see sold in America is going to be from uh, ranched bison, not wild bison. So instead of having the allocation of wildlife by the free market, this new model is saying legal policies are going to shape how wildlife will be used. So you can't just hunt even if there's a demand in the market. Hunting opportunities for all. We're going to be talking about hunting a lot because as surprising as it might sound, hunters are going to be crucial to the development of American conservation efforts. Sounds kind of counterintuitive because we think, oh, hunters just want to hunt animals. That's not quite the way it works out. So hunting opportunities for all. We want anyone who wants to hunt to have the opportunity to hunt, or at least the chance to hunt certain years. So we see a lot of new laws being implemented, hunting seasons, all these kinds of things, which we'll talk about. Wildlife use must have a purpose. This means I can't simply go hunt a deer or a bison as a trophy. So if I shoot a deer, I have to harvest the meat. I have to try to use the hide if I can. I can't just kill it and take its antlers and mount them on my wall and leave the meat to rot. That is illegal in today's standards. And this is what's evolving over these years. International resources. This is pertaining particularly to fish and migratory bird species. So as fish move up and down the coastline or up and down rivers that may cross borders, or as birds migrate with the seasons, we have to make treaties and agreements with our neighbors to make sure these animal species are preserved and not hunted to extinction. So we can preserve them within our borders, but we have to make sure, say, Canada or Mexico or South America also has similar laws to protect them so that even when they're not within the United States borders, they're still protected. And finally, we see scientific management. And we'll see this grow a lot at first with the forestry and then slowly with wildlife management as well. And this is understanding how herds work, the interaction between forests and nature works, so that as humans interact with it, we're not unduly disturbing the process. So we need to study it, we need to observe it, we need to understand how it's working so that when we do make changes, because we inevitably make changes simply by being humans and entering a space, we're going to change it. We need to understand the effects of these changes. So this is kind of the framework in which as we talk over the next several laws and as we get to the modern day, this is what we're building towards. Now, speaking of that scientific management, in 1902, we get the Newlands Reclamation Act, which this is kind of a double-edged sword. This is going to be a major irrigation effort all across the American West. You'll see virtually every major western river get dammed. 
Now, dams are good in many ways, but they're also problematic in a lot of ways. The more we understood about dams in the modern era, the more we realized they have sometimes a very negative impact on the environment, particularly with migratory fish species. So we found ways to mitigate some of that in modern dam building, but there are still a lot of issues we haven't fully resolved. Now we'll see a lot of dams and there is a lot of irrigation benefits, farming benefits. We'll see a lot of recreation benefits as these lakes develop from these dammed rivers. And most importantly, we'll start seeing a lot of these new dams become hydroelectric, hydroelectric dams over the years, which provide very cheap and effective power resources for the nation. We'll see many of the hydroelectric dams built during the during the New Deal during the Great Depression. 1903, Theodore Roosevelt and John Muir, who had become friends by this point, traveled out to Yosemite. Now this is on the cusp of or right after Roosevelt became president. He travels out with John Muir. They go hike and camp in Yosemite. They both have a good time. John Muir actually describes Roosevelt as one of the most pleasant camping partners he has ever had. They really got along. They really hit it off and they'll become lifelong friends. And Muir will actually convince Roosevelt to take what is at the time with Yosemite, a state park in California, and transform it into another national park like, like Yellowstone. So this is going to be another one of these park preservation methods on the national level. And this is Roosevelt just getting started. As he becomes president, we'll see a whole slew of new changes come onto the scene. Another major player during Roosevelt's presidency is going to be a guy named Gifford Pinchot. He is a prominent conservationist, not quite as popular as Muir, but he will rise to prominence in his own way. And he is going to be kind of the father of American forestry. And he's going to be appointed the first head of the United States Forestry Service. Now, these are the guys that are managing all of the national forests that were begun during that earlier period. Because we had these preserved forests that we were kind of using, kind of not. But now we have an official service that's dedicated to making sure no one's abusing it, no one's illegally taking resources or timber, and to help making sure that the ecosystem of these wild places are preserved for future generations. Now, Pichot and the Forest Service are going to focus around three main goals during this time period. First is development. So finding ways to use portions of these forests for the benefit of the nation. So this will involve some logging, but logging that also puts trees back in and it kind of creates a rotation of logging. And this is good up until a point. Old growth forests are better. They have a more diverse ecology, but keeping the forests intact is important as well. So it's good, but we'll develop better ways over the years to preserve it. Then conservation. So as far as the Forest Service is concerned, it's trying to prevent waste. So making sure that since human race, in his words, was in control of the earth that it lived upon, it was our job to making sure it was co conserved and used in the future as well. And then the protection of the public interests. And he said, quote, the natural resources must be developed and preserved for the benefit of the many and not merely for the profit of the few. And this kind of rings true with the time and the era, this progressive era that we're talking about, <clears throat> because you start seeing the rise of the robber barons and the rise of new industrialization. And people are kind of reaping massive rewards by using up natural resources. And Roosevelt and his Forest Service are trying to protect some of these things at this time. Also see him put forth the Antiquities Act in 1906. Now he signs this into existence and when he signs it, it creates 18 national monuments that are protected. So this is one of the big ones that the picture is. It's Devil's Horn, I believe. Uh, it has 18 national monuments, 51 bird reserves, four wild game reserves, 150 natural for or national forests in total. 
it sets aside about 230 million acres of land. In 1906, we see the Grand Canyon National Park be created. So it's one of the most iconic features in the United States. So that one gets created, but and we'll see a few more stuff done in the interim kind of 10 or 20 years. But the next big event that hits the United States that will see a lot of conservation efforts is going to be during the Great Depression and the New Deal. So the Great Depression will destabilize the American economy, will cause a lot of heartache and pain. That's going to be paired with an economic and ecological disaster called the Dust Bowl, where we see massive amounts of fields in the Midwest just blow away. Crops eaten up by locusts and then the soil just blows away because of over plowing and erosion of the topsoil. So this is a major disaster that we'll see some effort to fix during the New Deal. Now it's going to be Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt's cousin, that will, whether intentionally or inadvertently, begin a new wave of change and preservation efforts, kind of continuing his older cousin's tradition. He's going to propose the New Deal, kind of a play off Theodore Roosevelt's uh, square deal. Now, this New Deal had a lot of different programs trying to restart the American economy. We're only going to focus on the ones that focus or that relate to conservation and environmentalism. Probably the single most important is going to be the Civilian Conservation Corps. So this is kind of a pseudo militaristic organization where they took young men like 18 to like 25 years old, sent them out in kind of army styled work camps and they would go all around the nation they would be paid you know 18 or 25 dollars a month and 75 percent of that would be sent back to their family where the young men only kept a small portion this was trying to give these men jobs but while also support the families back home to making sure they didn't just waste the money now they did a lot of different stuff they built bridges and fire lookout towers Whenever you go out to any national park today and you see campgrounds, a lot of them are gonna be built by conservation, the Civilian Conservation Corps. You'll see irrigation, checking dams, building ditches, planting trees, disease control, picnic grounds, uh, the elimination of predatory animals, which that becomes a bit problematic as we will learn later on. We see stream improvement, stocking of fish in various lakes and fishes and then various other emergency work efforts that will be developed during the time so if you go to wild places and you see some of the old trails or campsites or lodges that are built on many of our national parks today odds are it was built by the civilian conservation corps and this is going to be one of the very successful programs that gives people work and really helps kind of restart the u.s economy at the same time, you have the Forest Service work projects. Now this focused on a lot of different stuff, but mainly it's gonna be the planting of trees. They plant something like 13 million trees over the course of these work projects during the Great Depression. So they're basically paying young men to go out, travel across the nation and plant trees. So just another way to get money into the hands of the people while providing jobs. One of the more revolutionary and controversial acts is gonna be the Agricultural Adjustment Act which is going to change the way Americans are farming because the Dust Bowl revealed a lot of the problems with the way we were farming because we basically just plowed the entire Great Plains up and left no grasslands and most of that soil blew away during the Dust Bowl. It's a little more complicated than that and we'll talk a little bit more about it a little bit later, but it's a bit problematic. Now, during this Agricultural Adjustment Act, they're going to do some controversial things like they'll take fields out of production they will pour out milk and dispose of milk rather than just giving the food to the people because they're trying to boost the economy by rising the price of agricultural crops by creating an artificial scarcity. So it's controversial, but eventually they find ways to get some of it passed. Another act that's going to be passed during this time is the Migratory Bird Hunting Stamp Act or the Duck Stamp Act. So this is during duck hunting season. You'll go buy one of these stamps and this money will be used and sent to wildlife conservation and preservation for migratory bird species. It's a trend of laws 
that place various taxes or where you have to buy certain licenses or stamps whenever you want to go hunt or fish. And it might seem silly, oh, why do I need to go get a fishing license from Walmart or Cabela's or Academy just to go fish? Well, it's not so much about managing the fish, and that's part of it. It's about raising money so that the federal government can actually maintain and protect these wild places. In Texas in 1935, so during the Great Depression as well, we see the creation of Big Bend National Park. If you've never been out to Big Bend, it is a truly beautiful place. I highly recommend winter trips out to Big Bend because it stays fairly warm in Big Bend year round. It gets down to the 50s or so, but it makes it for a great hike because you can hike up into the mountains. It's about a 3,000 foot elevation if you go to the very peak of the Chisos Mountains. So it's a beautiful place. It's about eight hours from DFW, so it's a bit of a drive, but it's well worth it. And you can see a lot of kind of scenic views around. There's a lot of cool places out there. So I highly recommend at least some point in your life going to visit Big Bend out in West Texas. One of the most important laws that will ever be passed in wildlife conservation in the United States is the Pittman-Robertson Act in 1937. Now, this is going to create what's called an excise tax. It'll put an 11% tax on hunting and fishing equipment. So this talks about guns, boats, bows and arrows, rifles, ammunition, fishing line, all this kinds of stuff. There's an 11% tax put on that. That tax goes immediately and directly to the US government. The US government then takes that tax and divides it up amongst the 50 states, and each state gets a certain amount of that tax depending on several factors. And then the state uses that for their fish and game services to regulate and promote conservation efforts within that state. So Texas gets this money every year. So whenever you go even sports shooting. So say you just like going to the shooting range and doing that. Whenever you buy ammunition or a rifle, you're helping support American conservation, whether you know it or not. And this is where hunting is kind of this weird thing because hunters, many of them know this is happening, but even the ones that don't, they're still participating. They're still helping preserve all the places that they're using. So this is gonna have a dramatic impact. More money will be raised from the Pittman-Robertson Act than any other donation-based conservation movement in American history. So the Pittman-Robertson Act so far has raised probably $12 billion through this tax. So this is a big contribution. In, and when you put it in tandem with other government sponsoring, this is a big, big deal. Now, 1937 kind of marks the end. We'll have a slight stalling out of conservation efforts, primarily because of World War II. The whole world is distracted by the single biggest military conflict in American or world history. Now, the World War II era is an era that includes a greater mix of preservation, but it's partially as a result of this new problems that we're gonna create after World War II. We have to understand World War II is going to push American technology, American scientific knowledge, American medical knowledge to new heights. We develop a whole slew of new vaccines. We develop new nuclear technologies. We develop plastics and other petroleum-based technologies. We develop new fuel technologies all through this. And America is very excited about this. We start consuming these resources in large numbers. And this is going to have unintended consequences on our environment that we are still only fully grasping today. Now, the first of these will begin with Bikini Atoll in 1946. So the Bikini Atoll are or is the location of many of the U.S. Navy and the U.S. military's atomic bomb tests. Found out when I was in college that my grandfather was actually on one of the Navy boats that was stationed out to watch these nuclear detonations at this time. Now we start this process, we're detonating it because we don't know what it does, we don't know what the issues of nuclear radiation are, we're still figuring it all the stuff. But as we figure it out, we start realizing both the potential good and the potential harm of nuclear power. 
nuclear kind of fever takes over the world. And we start seeing the use of nuclear material as a power source, as weapons, as all these different kinds of things. Sometimes with good results, and sometimes with not so good results. So you have the Chernobyl disaster in Russia. You have the Fukushima disaster in Japan. You have the Three Mile Island disaster in or accident in America. So we see these problems. And this is going to give nuclear power a very bad name because it seems not very safe. It seems unstable. Now keep in mind, they were doing this in the 60s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, before we had a full grasp over how to do this. Modern nuclear power that's built in most places around the world, very safe, very stable, it's far better. But because of all these accidents over you know, the past 50 to 70 years, the regulations are very stringent, so we don't see a lot of nuclear power in America in use today, although that is starting to change in some places, Texas included. We'll see oil spills becoming a plague, both out of oil tankers, as well as leaks out of deep sea drilling. After World War II, we'll see the rise of industrial agriculture. And this is going to be very new for America. While we had problems with things like the Dust Bowl prior to World War II, after World War II with the development of chemical fertilizer, initially designed for bombs, but then realized things like nitrogen, while it blows up well, also fertilizes fields really well. So we'll see the growth of industrial monocrop agriculture. This is when we start getting GMOs. This is when we start seeing big fields of wheat or various grains or corn or all these different things, soybeans. And this is going to have a deleterious effect on the economy or on the ecology. We start depleting our topsoil. Best estimates, most of our topsoil in the big farming regions of the United States is being depleted rapidly. We maybe have 20 to 50 years left of large industrial scale agriculture on these places before the topsoil can't sustain production even with kind of added fertilizers. On the animal side, you see industrial kind of animal production, so factory farms. In particular, chickens and pigs are the worst. Beef is bad in some cases, but beef is probably the least of the three, simply because they are out on fields grazing most of the time. Only the last three or four months are some of them brought into feedlots and fed grain. But we'll talk more about kind of this issue and what to do about it later on. But we have all these issues kind of coming onto the scene as a result of new technologies of World War II, but we see kind of in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, a pushback in trying to fix some of the problems that are arising over these decades. One of the first big creations after World War II is the Bureau of Land Management in 1946. So this is a combination of the General Land Office and the Grazing Services for the United States. And the goal of the mission of the BLM is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the public lands for use and enjoyment of present and future generations. So basically, these are all the unowned lands in America. Now, like stuff like South Dakota and Oklahoma, those are not completely unknown. There's large tracts of BLM land, but it's not necessarily all of this is BLM land. But these are the counties and territories that have a lot of BLM in them. Now this is free use land, so you can get grazing rights to it, you can get timber rights to this, you can get hunting permits to go on this land. This, there's a lot of land in the United States that you can use free of charge. You just have to get permission or permits to use it. So just keep this in mind that we are managing large tracts of land that don't really have people. So we think of like Fort Worth or Dallas or New York or any of the major cities around the United States as, oh, we're eating up all of our territory. There's people everywhere. But there are really large tracts of the United States that are still relatively untouched, relatively empty. You go up to Wyoming or Montana, the Dakotas or Idaho, there's not a lot of people outside of a few of the major cities in those states. The Dingle Johnson Sport Fishing Restoration Act. So this is exactly like the uh, Pittman Robertson Act, but for sport fishing. So it adds in a lot of other fishing gear that have that excise tax as well. Uh, <clears throat> you have Johnson, 
So from our home state of Texas, Lyndon Baines Johnson is going to, as president, sign into act the Wilderness Act, which sets aside even more land for American use and preservation. It sets aside an additional 9.1 million acres of federal land. And most importantly, it will designate what it means by wilderness. And Howard Zanizer is going to define for the government what this is. This is what they include in the act. A wilderness, in contrast with those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape, is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. So this is how today in our government, in this poetic form, which is nice for a change other than business speak, defines what the wilderness is. Now we're going to begin getting into kind of the 60s, 70s, 80s. We're going to start moving a little bit quicker as we'll see a lot of new little acts come into play. We'll talk about the highlights of some of these. So we have the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, which protects wild and scenic rivers, as it says. So it'll, trying to design these both for environmental protection and recreational protection for these rivers. You get the Clean Air Act, which starts putting a lot of new regulation in place so that factories and manufacturing places can't add to air pollution. And we see a great improvement of air pollution and smog reduction in the United States since the 1970s as a result of this. In 1972, we get a whole slew of new laws. You get the Water Pollution Act, you get the NEPA, EPA, the NOAA. Now, the EPA is probably the single most important because the Environmental Protection Agency is going to be the one that goes in and creates a whole bunch of new regulation, a whole bunch of new policies, and has some teeth built into it to fine and punish companies that violate some of these laws. And we'll see a lot of progress being made. Often it's slow progress, and we see kind of some back steps at times as policies change over the years. But in general, the EPA has been a net good for the nation. Although manufacturing and corporations don't always see eye to eye with EPA policies. Next, we get the Endangered Species Act, which protects wild species. And they have two main goals, to protect and prevent the extinction of a species and to help it recover to the point it can be removed from the wild or from the endangered species list. You get safe drinking water, which is designed to make sure every residential place has access to safe drinking water. Now we've seen this be an issue in recent years with places like Flint, Michigan, where they don't have safe drinking water. And it's as a result of corporation issues and all the stuff you hear about in the news. Now we'll talk a little bit more about water issues later on because water is gonna be one of the big issues going forward in world concerns. Resource Conservation Recovery Act, which deals with toxic materials, how to do away with them. So this is toxic waste from manufacturing, nuclear waste from refining and all these different kinds of things. It's how do we handle that? What do we do? What's a safe way to manage that? And we're still figuring that out even today. 18 in the 90s, you'll see a new shift in wildlife conservation and preservation in the sense that it gets pushed. And this is in part due to corporate influence, but it's pushed onto the consumer rather than the manufacturer. Basically, it's sold to the American citizen. It's your job to recycle. It's your job to use less gas, not the big companies. Now, the average consumer doesn't use a lot of waste. They don't, as far as like comparison to what a manufacturing or a factory produce or transportation in general produces. The individual user isn't that big, but they sell it to the American people and it becomes a cultural phenomenon during the 80s and 90s. In particular, we see things like Captain Planet come onto the scene where you have this fad of environmentalism. We see the first Earth Day kind of coming on to existence. And that was in 1972. And you see in the 80s and 90s, Earth Day is going to be a huge deal. So we see it as a cultural thing. But that culture, even in the 80s and 90s, is starting to shift away from this as well. We see this most drastically with Ronald Reagan and the rise of the new right. We're not going to talk about the political side of this, but we see a political alliance between the Republican Party and corporations and the Democrats and kind of environmentalist movements 
where they begin kind of tying environmental issues to political ideologies, which is problematic for the nation because the environment should never be political. It should be something we all share. It should be something we can all agree on. We want to preserve for future generations. But as we know and understand even in today, that is a problem for the world. Now we're going to run through a few of the issues facing the nation today. So one of the biggest is carbon emissions. We know for a fact greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases have increased dramatically, particularly since industrialization. Now we've had higher periods of greenhouse gases over Earth's history, but very rarely does it increase in only 100 or 200 years. Usually it's spread out over a much longer time period. So we're talking thousands of years, but because of human intervention, we have accelerated this change and it's pretty undeniable that it's in large part due to the use of fossil fuels. So of all form and shape. So whether it's gas, coal, oil, whatever we're using, it is problematic. And that's generally accepted today by people on both sides of the political spectrum. Now, climate change is less controversial than it used to be. Most people agree climate change is happening because it's starting to be undeniable when, you know, like in Texas, we keep getting all these weird freezes. We see in California and places like Australia, these wildfires that are just unmanageable. We see new droughts all across the world. We see new storms hitting on a regular basis, more intense hurricanes than ever before, massive flooding. And speaking Water. Water is going to be one of the biggest issues. Everything in blue over the next, you know, anywhere from 20 to 100 years, many of these places are estimated to be underwater, particularly places like New Orleans and Miami are at huge risk. They are having regular flooding on a monthly basis. So this is a problem we are experiencing even today. And then in the center of the nation, it's not flooding that we're worried about. We're worried about depleting our underwater water aquifers because we're using mass irrigation to water our crops and fields. It is a huge problem there as well. So water is going to be one of the major issues of the future, particularly fresh drinking water. Now potential solutions. We're going to see a lot of different options. One of the first is regenerative agriculture. So this is changing our way of farming. Instead of plowing up all the fields and leaving barren fields, we're going to leave cover crops. We're going to have more localized farming. So we're not shipping crops all the way around the world. We can reduce some of that shipping cost. Things like intensive grazing has shown a lot of promise in places like Texas. So in North Texas, we see several major ranches. So we're talking thousands of acres starting to use this intensive grazing where instead of just letting the cows graze over the whole field, you focus them in small portions of the field and say, you kind of see on this picture where the cows are in this one section that's fenced off, they won't return. So they'll graze it real heavily over, you know, three days a week, then they'll be moved on and they won't return to this lot of grass for a year or more. And in that time, the grasslands have a time to come back species begin to diversify and it really shows a lot of regrowth of the grasslands and allows more head of cattle to be grazed with less space. So it's actually beneficial in every aspect and it's starting to catch on in America today. You see an effort to restore the Great Plains. So many of the Great Plains regions have been plowed up and you can kind of see on this right hand picture what the old grasslands, their root systems were like versus what modern wheat crop roots would look like. And the deep roots means they can survive drought, they can retain water, and most importantly, it is a huge amount of carbon sequestration. So we can pull a lot of carbon out of the air by returning chunks of the Great Plains back to native grasslands. Not to mention, we can bring back some of the big herd species like the bison. Then you have renewable energies. So solar, hydro, wind, tidal, geothermal, biomass, all of these are great options. So we have hydro probably being the most controversial of these because we're having to redesign a lot of our dams to be less impactful on the environment, on 
fish species, on flooded areas, all this kind of stuff. It has more harm than we initially thought, but it's still better than burning coal and various things like that. Now, Texas alone, on a good day, Texas gets about 90% of its power from solar and wind. So this is something that's happening right now. So in the next 50 years, odds are Texas will get majority of its power from solar and wind on a regular basis. Now, there is the inclusion of nuclear. So nuclear is back on the playing field in some ways because we're now starting to consider these micro nuclear plants dotted across the United States because they're far safer. They have far better safety measures and checks than ever before. Now, in most recent history, we have the proposal by the Biden administration in his Build Back Better plan of the Civilian Climate Corps. So very similar to the Conservation Corps during the New Deal. They will be kind of doing a lot of new programs, giving lots of new jobs that are government funded to build things to benefit the environment. So avoiding like defenses for climate disasters, new infrastructures, adding solar panels, wind energy, all this kinds of stuff to help bolster the nation. And you also now have this growth of ecotourism where people are traveling around the world to see wild and to learn about how to better protect our ecology. There's a lot of good from this. There's some bad because some of the travel that's involved may not be as an advantageous to the environment as we might hope. But this is kind of a growing way to popularize and educate the nation and the world about our ecology and ecological issues in our changing climate. Now, I want to kind of close with some local options in kind of Tarrant County, focusing around Fort Worth. And these are just some of the ones I know about. There's a lot more out there. So if you like me, but you don't necessarily want to, you know, support factory farming, Burgundy's Local is a great place. I'm sure there's other kind of local farming production that does meat and meat production, but Burgundy's Local is great. They all have grass fed and grass finished animals. So they do beef, pork, chicken, they have eggs and cheese, all kinds of stuff. So this is a great option and it's not really any more expensive than regular meat, particularly if you buy it in bulk. Then you get places like Stone's Throw Farm, which these are small scale farms that basically they are traveling farmer's market and they set up shop around the area of their farm for people to come. I know in my neighborhood, Stone's Throw comes and they set up a little trailer every week on Wednesday and you can go buy fresh vegetables and other goods from the thing. And you can check in your area. I would be willing to bet there are similar farms or you can join a farming co-op, which you sign up for a local farm and every year or every season, you know, every week or every month, whatever you sign up for, you get a box of produce from that farm. So there's all these ideas. And then when we talk about recycling, what you can do on a daily basis. So you have normal recycling that Tarrant County does pick up, that Fort Worth and your local cities do pick up. So I highly recommend taking advantage of recycle. You know, the probably the most recyclable things are paper products, cardboard, and aluminum cans. Plastics are iffy in America today. Sometimes they get recycled. A lot of times they just get sent to the dump anyways. I recommend trying to recycle them but and try not to just throw anything in the recycling. Don't just say, I don't know if it takes it, I'll just toss it in. Really look up what your city takes and what they're looking for and what types of plastic they accept because if they find there's too much contaminants in a batch of recycling, they just throw the whole thing out into the dump. So really do make an effort of trying to filter through what you're throwing away. But there's a lot of good recycling stations and drop off points around Fort Worth you can drop off styrofoam, batteries, electronics. I know Fort Worth has mulch you can pick up for free. Every month you can go fill up a truck full of mulch and get mulch free for your yard. So there's a lot of good resources. I really recommend looking into your city, into your community stuff and seeing what's available because there's stuff out there. You just got to tap into it. But I'll stop there for today and I'll open it up to any questions. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mencken. That was a, a really good presentation. Um, I guess one of the first questions to ask is, uh, you mentioned earlier that you're a member of the Sierra Club. Um, I'm just wondering if you could kind of explain for everyone, um, you know, what, what is the uh, focus of the Sierra Club? What do they do? 
Yeah, so Sierra Club does a pretty wide spectrum of things. So the lectures can range from, you know, just normal gardening stuff. And speaking of gardening, the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens and the Botanic Research Institute of Texas at the Botanic Gardens, they have a great resource for gardening, sending out gardening tips and everything else. So you can sign up for their newsletter too. Those are great. But the Sierra Club, they have seminars that can range from gardening to hiking trips to environmental causes and like campaigning for like reaching out and talking to your representatives, emailing your representatives, calling them, visiting them in their office for both state and national legislation. So Sierra Club really covers the whole gamut and you can kind of focus on whatever niche you want. So I haven't been as active, you know, because of COVID lately, but I've attended a few online seminars. It's been great. I do some of the activism. Whenever those pop up, I'll send my emails and do that kind of stuff whenever I support the cause that they're suggesting. So it's, it's really a great resource to kind of learn what's out there and kind of just dip your toe into it because you don't have to go or do anything. It's free to join. So you can just join, become a member, and then if you want to donate and do all that kind of stuff, that's great and get more involved, but you don't necessarily have to. Okay, and another question. Um, do you see any um, any new national parks being created going forward? Um, is, is there really been any push or movement for uh, creating new national parks? Yeah, in my, not huge national parks, so we might see some new ones in the case of Puerto Rico. If Puerto Rico becomes and gets approved for statehood, there might be asset or access or pathways for national parks for some of the rainforests in Puerto Rico to be preserved. But I think our best chance at new ones would be in the Great Plains area because what's happening is as farming issues keep cropping up in the Great Plains, we see a lot of smaller farmers having to sell to larger corporations or just leave their community because it's not sustainable anymore. And they either get sold off to large corporations that are these industrial level farming or there's a lot of NGOs and nonprofit organizations that are beginning to buy up these Great Plains farms on the old Great Plains and trying to build contiguous tracts of land to kind of restore the Great Plains that Great Plains Restoration Council was part of this. And they're trying to build this thing. And I could see that becoming kind of a Plains Great Park where you just kind of drive through it and there's like one or two highways through it. You drive through it and you could see bison herds and all these other kinds of things that as it would have been, you know, when the westward migration was happening. But I think that's kind of our best chance in the near future for kind of wildlife preservation or uh, state national parks being created. But you do see state parks created on a more regular basis. All right, thank you. Um, and another question is, so do you see, um, well, I guess the, a better way to phrase this is, uh, what kind of so-called green jobs uh, do you see becoming available for people in the not so near future? We've got uh, a lot of our students are, you know, they're going to college, they're getting degrees, they're trying to figure out what they want to do with their life. Uh, do you see uh, any opportunities for students going forward in, in what we call green jobs? Yeah. I see this kind of in two avenues. So you have the technology side, which is going to be kind of engineering scientific fields where you're doing things like solar panels and other kind of renewable energy focused things or kind of civil planning where you're trying to build a more sustainable city. And that's one avenue I think would be, you know, honorable and good to go into where you're still potentially have chances to make you know a decent living good money you're still living in kind of an urban environment but you're contributing in a lot of important ways then there's another avenue which is growing in popularity and i think is going to be equally as important for creating a sustainable future which is this return to the land and i'm not necessarily talking about homesteading where you're just you and your family are living out on a farm and not talking to anybody it's not quite what i'm talking about but it's where you do have a farming component and you are working with your local community and we see this in places like detroit today where you have urban farms being set up in some of the abandoned you know city blocks in detroit and this is a growing thing where you have urban farms you have kind of near urban area farms and i think that's going to be a very crucial future component for kind of a green job particularly if you like being out in the world and not sitting behind a desk 
you know, working at a computer all day. So I think those are kind of the two avenues, something in the agricultural sector where you're doing kind of small scale farming, but in kind of the regenerative sense, and then in the technology and engineering side where you're building cities and developing new technologies that might, you know, support either power generation or how to build sustainable homes or buildings or communities. All right, thank you for that. Uh, well, that's all the questions we have. Um, just want to thank you for your time this afternoon uh, for giving us a wonderful presentation uh, and thank you to everyone who attended this as well. Uh, have a nice afternoon. Thank yes, you. Thank you. You all have a great day. You too.